Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Liz Kruger, the state senator from the 28th district. And we are with us tonight to learn more about the scams you need to be aware of now that it's the holiday season, learning to protect yourself during the holidays against the most common telephone and internet scams. And I gotta tell you, these are out there every day, ready to get us. So before we go right into the um, presentation, I always like to remind everyone that you might be watching in three different ways, viewing on Zoom or on Facebook Live, or some of you might be just calling into the town hall discussion. I wanna remind you that if you're on either Zoom or Facebook, you have a closed caption option where you can read along whatever anyone is saying, and it can really help for people who have any kind of hearing issues. So if you're on Zoom, click on live transcript in the meeting controls to start viewing closed captioning on the bottom of your screen. And if you're in the Facebook Live event, you'll see a setting button in the bottom right hand corner of the video. Click closed caption CC to start viewing the closed captioning. We always start with announcements. Unfortunately, I still have COVID related announcements. I was hoping to get to the point where we didn't have to talk about COVID every day, but it's just not true. We are continuing to see significant increases in COVID-19 cases and hospitalization rates throughout the state and unfortunately in New York City. It is critical to get your booster shot as soon as, if you, as, soon as you are eligible. Individuals 16 and 17 are now able to get Pfizer booster shots if six months have passed since their second dose of the vaccine and everybody else as an adult is. This is crucial because the new version of COVID-19 um, Omicron variant is actually virtually and starting to be everywhere. The governor has issued a statewide indoor mask mandate due to our surging numbers. This includes all indoor public spaces, such as entertainment venues, recreational spaces, grocery stores, and common areas in residential buildings. That means if you're in the elevator, wear a mask. The mandate took effect on December 13th and will remain in effect until January 15th, at which time we'll be reassessing the situation. Local health departments are responsible for enforcing the mandate. And now we're going to learn more about tonight's event. You should know that the event is being recorded. Everyone who RSVP'd for tonight's event will receive an email of a link to the video a couple of days after tonight's event. My office receives a large volume of calls about scams. With the holiday season here and scammers not taking any time off, we know that many of them are going to try to prey on your emotions and fears. I'm very pleased that Gary Brown, the statewide elder abuse coordinator and assistant attorney general in charge of the New York State Office of the Attorney General is with us this evening to present and will share important information about the most common scams and offer strategies to help us avoid them. After the presentation, I'll be moderating a Q&A portion of the event. And so now it is my pleasure to introduce Gary Brown. Hi, Gary. Hi, Senator Kruger. Thanks so much for the uh, invitation to speak tonight. And uh, I'm going to try to do my best to give you folks news you can use to stay safe in your daily lives. But let me first uh, thank you for inviting me on behalf of Attorney General Tisha James. Um, I'm gonna start out by walking through some of the waves of complaints that we've received since the outset of the pandemic briefly. And then I'm gonna focus on the common scams and frauds and how to avoid becoming a victim. But when the, when the pandemic first began in, in March of 2020, we started receiving thousands of price gouging complaints at the attorney general's office. Items like toilet paper, paper towels, bleach, disinfecting wipes, eggs, to name a few. It was very hard to find these items we issued nearly 2,000 cease and desist letters to businesses that we, we believed were engaged in price gouging. But by the late spring and summer of 2020, we stopped receiving price gouging complaints for the most part. And I think the reason for that is twofold. 
One is that we stop panic buying and hoarding some of those items quite as much as we had been. And the other is that the manufacturers ratcheted up production to try to meet demand. So we're not getting price gouging complaints since then in any great volume, but if we do, we stand ready to enforce the price gouging law. Another complaint, type of complaint that we got a lot of at the outset of the pandemic are what we're calling refund cancellation complaints. People booked venues to hold weddings, bar mitzvahs, et cetera. They bought tickets to events that got canceled. These events got canceled and people were having trouble getting their money back. So if that happened to you, I would encourage you to file a complaint with the AG's office. We've had a pretty good batting average of getting companies to make the refunds they're required to make. And by way of example, the Green Tree Country Club in my home county of Westchester uh, recently made over $400,000 in refunds to 76 consumers who had booked events that were canceled uh, during the first months of the pandemic. So if that's happened to you, please reach out to our office. Another thing we saw at the outset of the pandemic were fake cures and treatments being sold primarily online. As Attorney General James would say, fake lotions and potions. The Federal Trade Commission sent warning letters to hundreds of companies that were advertising fake cures, treatments, and preventative therapies for COVID-19. Many of these products and services were targeting older adults since they're more vulnerable to COVID and more likely to have underlying medical conditions that put them at greater risk. The vast majority of these have since been taken down. To give you an exa some examples of the type of phony products that were being hawked as a treatment or cure for COVID, cannabinol, colloidal silver, vitamin C therapy. There was a company in Texas claiming that it, the mare's milk, the horse milk that it sold could help people recover from COVID. There was a company in Canada that was claiming that its tea could do the same. Radio talk show host Alex Jones was hawking a super blue toothpaste. And in my home county of Westchester, there was a spa in Yonkers that was claiming that its therapeutic regimen could prevent and treat COVID-19. We had to send them a cease and desist letter. Um, so now that the vaccine has become available, we're seeing much less of that, although we're still seeing products like horse deworm warmer and some other crazy products being hawked. Uh, but for the most part, now that the vaccines are available, that, that problem seems to have ebbed. The most common complaint that we received during the pandemic so far, and the most common complaint received by the Federal Trade Commission has been about online shopping, meaning people are going online, they're buying items and they're never getting them. They're never being delivered. In particular, there's been an issue when people are trying to buy and adopt pets online which a lot of uh, social isolation has led people to want to get a pet. They're going online, they're paying in advance and they're not getting the pet. So the classic online shopping tips apply more than ever. Purchase from reputable sites you've heard of and dealt with before. And most importantly, always pay by credit card when you're shopping online. Don't send cash, don't send cryptocurrency and don't use a debit card. And let me briefly explain why that is. If I go online today and I buy something and I pay by credit card, I'm gonna get a bill at the end of the month that's payable maybe two or three weeks after that. So if I don't get the item, I can dispute the charge before I even ever have to pay. It buys me some time between the date of the transaction and the date I have to pay. If I use my debit card to make that purchase today, the money was withdrawn from my account immediately upon closing the transaction. And if I later realize that the product didn't arrive, I'm in the much worse position of trying to get money back from the bank that issued me the debit card than disputing the charge with a credit card company. And it's been our experience that even when people have paid before they realize that they got, they didn't get the item that they had offered, it's much easier to get a charge back from a credit card company than it is to get a cash refund from a debit card company. So use that debit card to go to the ATM and withdraw cash, but when you're shopping online, use your credit card. Another complaint that we've gotten so, thousands, so many thousands of during the pandemic has been from people who got a letter from the State Department of Labor about the unemployment claim that they never filed meaning that someone else had filed an unemployment claim, insurance claim in that person's name. If that happens to you, it means your social security number has been compromised. So you've got to go into identity theft prevention overdrive if that has happened to you. The good news is that in very few of these cases is the Department of Labor making payments on these false claims. But the bad news is it's just an indication of how, wide, how widespread identity theft has become so that so many people's social security numbers are out there. So you're going to want to do things like let the Department of Labor know that it was not you, let your employer know, freeze your credit report, change your passwords. The Federal Trade Commission has a wonderful website. It's called identitytheft.gov, identity theft as one word, .gov, that has step-by-step -step instructions on what to do if that has happened to you. When vaccines first became available and it was hard to get an appointment, we saw vaccine scams, websites claiming that for a fee, they could help you jump the line and get an appointment sooner than you could otherwise. Of course, the vaccine is free. 
There's no way to have jumped the line then, so that was a scam. Now that the vaccines have become more widely available, that's no longer been an issue. So what I want to do now is segue and talk about the classic scams. How is it that scammers try to rip us off? What are their targets? Who are their targets and what are their techniques and how can you avoid becoming a victim? You heard Senator Kruger mention at the outset that my title at the Attorney General's office is Statewide Elder Abuse Coordinator. And the reason that position was created several years ago was a recognition of the fact that for the most part, as you're gonna hear me explain, unfortunately, it's very hard to catch these scammers. It's even harder to recover money from victim, for victims. But these are preventable scams if we know how they work. So we've really ratcheted up our prevention, our awareness efforts, and that's why a program like tonight is so important. Seniors are often targeted for these scams and financial exploitation. They may be more likely to be home and answer the phone. Social isolation may lead to them answering the phone. And uh, with so many seniors now using the internet, online scams are an increasing concern. We did a study in New York back in 2016 to figure how much money was being lost to these scams. And the number came in at about $1.5 billion a year just in New York. But that's certainly a low ball estimate because we also know that only about one in 44 victims of fraud like of, of the kind of scams I'm gonna talk about ever reported to anyone, let alone to the government. Now, some of the reluctance to report is understandable. People may blame themselves, they may be in denial, they may be ashamed. But what I think is also the reason a lot, in a lot of cases goes to a, a, a presentation that I gave a few years ago upstate. And I talked about the grandparent scam. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. And afterwards, a member of the audience came up to me and she said that she had been victimized by the grandparent scam. She had lost $3,000. And then she started hugging me and thanking me. And I couldn't quite figure out why. So I asked her and she said, Mr. Brown, you're the first person I've ever told that I fell victim to this scam. And I said, really? You didn't tell your grandchild? You didn't tell your adult children? And she looked at me and she said, oh, no. If they knew I had fallen for an imposter scam like this, they'd think, uh-oh, I'm losing my senses. Time to take over my finances. Time to put me in assisted living, something like that. And she said, I'd rather suffer the loss of money in silence than risk the loss of self-control that I fear would happen if I told anybody. And so whereas that emotion, uh, that reluctance is understandable, it also eats people up. You know, if your car is stolen, you call the police. If your house is burglarized, you call the police. But if a scammer pretends to be your grandson and rips you off over the phone, you don't feel you can tell anybody. And it really makes it even worse. If there's one misconception that people have about these scams, it's that they think the scammers are trying to outsmart us. They're trying to trick us. But what they're much more often trying to do is to push our emotional buttons to get us to react based on our emotions and not to take our brain out of the equation so we're not really thinking. And I think the best example of the fact that it's not about intelligence, it's about emotions. Anybody can be ripped off no matter how smart they are. Is to briefly mention the biggest current artist in the history of the United States of America, Bernie Madoff. Madoff stole over $60 billion running a Ponzi scheme. And yet when you look at who his victims were, they were not stupid people. They were among the smartest and most sophisticated institutional and individual investors in the world. What Madoff did was he appealed to the greed factor. He offered fantastical guaranteed returns. People you would think would have known better that there's no such thing as a guaranteed investment, that those returns were unreal, uh, investment returns projected were unrealistic. But greed is a factor. I think we all, and on some level, there's an element of greed in all of us. Deep down, we all wanna be the grand prize winner. Deep down, we all wanna pay the lowest price. And deep down, we want the best return on our investment. And my takeaway is that if, if Bernie Madoff can figure out how to rip off the smartest, richest institutional and individuals and investors in the country, anybody could fall victim to a scam if the con artist, if the scammer figures out the right emotional button to push. Now, if it seemed like the volume of robocalls that you were getting subsided during the first few months of the pandemic, you're right. We think maybe because a lot of the scammers themselves were on lockdown. But in recent months and as the year has gone by, we're right back where we started from. Uh, in September of this year, there were 7.9 million spam texts sent and 6.4 million phone calls, robocalls, just in New York State alone in the month of September. So these calls are out there. And what are the callers trying to do? They're going to try to push an emotional button. They're going to try to seem trustworthy or believable in some way. And then here's the huge red flag. They're going to tell you that there's an urgent deadline and that if you don't act immediately, Either you're gonna lose this once in a lifetime opportunity for something really good to happen, or else depending on the type of scam, something really bad is gonna to happen to you. They want you to feel an urgency. They don't want you thinking about it. They don't want you to consult with friends and relatives. They want you to act. The most common phone 
excuse me, the most common phone scam we've seen in the history of the country is the so-called IRS scam. This is the scam where the caller says he's an IRS agent, that you owe back taxes, and they're going to come and arrest you if you don't pay up today. Now, when you think about it, there are elements of this call that don't make any sense. For starters, does the IRS call you on the phone? No, they communicate by mail. Number two, do they threaten you with same-day arrest if you don't pay up? Of course not. And number three, do they tell you to pay your taxes by going to a local store, buying gift cards, and calling back with a serial number? No, it's almost laughable. Of course not. But if you don't know that this call is a scam, the emotion you're likely to feel is fear, fear of the IRS, fear of being arrested, fear of being in trouble. And I think deep down, most of us are kind of scared of the IRS anyway. And so this scam preys on that deep-seated fear. It's been estimated that the IRS scam was working about one in 50 calls. So 49 out of 50 people weren't falling for it. But when you multiply one in 50 times the millions of calls that were being made every year of that type, it translates into many victims who lost a lot of money. Now, in the last year or two, we've, we're seeing much less of the IRS scam. We think because for two reasons. One is so many of us have already gotten the call and we know it's a scammer with the other that we've heard about someone else who got the call and tells us it's a scam. So it just wasn't working as well anymore. And so the most common government imposter scam is now the social security scam. The caller says he's with social security. There's a problem with your account and they need to confirm that you're the person they're trying to reach and they ask you to sell to say your social security number over the phone. If you do that, it will then be used to commit identity theft. They may also tell you that there's a fee or a fine that you owe and tell you to go out and buy gift cards and call back with a serial number. Again, it's a scam. But the social security scam has become the most common of the government imposter scams that we're seeing. We're also seeing a lot of scam, uh, scam calls where the caller says that she's Becky from Medicare, Becky from Medicare. And she says that you qualify for a precautionary genetic cancer screening test that it's only available for a very limited time. Uh, and if you don't sign up for it immediately, you're gonna lose out. And they then ask you to provide your Medicare number uh, over the phone, which will then be used to commit medical identity theft. So beware of that one. As so many of us are shopping online, we've seen a lot of scams where you get a text or an email and it says it's from Amazon or some other company that may be delivering products, FedEx, and they say there's a problem with your delivery and they ask you to click on a link. And when you get there, they may tell you that there's a fee that you owe or they want personal identifying information from you. Don't fall for it. First of all, if you didn't order anything from that company, then obviously the message is a scam. But even if you did place an order with Amazon and you get a text message or an email like that, instead of clicking, clicking on the link in the message, go to Amazon's website or pick up the phone and call them directly so you can be sure you're communicating with them and not communicating with a spammer and a scammer. I mentioned earlier the grandparent scam. This is the scam that gets me the angriest because the emotion that it uses to rip people off is the love of a grandparent for a grandchild. The way the scam was working for the most part before the pandemic is the phone would ring at about four or five or six o'clock in the morning. Grandma's asleep, she doesn't have her wits about her. And let's face it, when the phone rings at that hour, it tends to be a call with bad news, not good news. If your grandson were calling to say he got into Harvard, he wouldn't call you at four or five o'clock in the morning. But if he were calling to say he had been arrested and needed you to bail him out, that's when you might get a call like that. So the phone rings, grandma's kind of worried it might be bad news anyway. And the caller pretends to be her grandson. He often didn't even know the name of the grandson he was impersonating. So he would start out by saying, hi grandma, it's your favorite grandson, hoping to prompt grandma to give him a name to work with. Once he had a name to work with, he was off to the races. He would say, first of all, Grandma, shh, please don't tell my parents that I got arrested. I need you to bail me out. If they knew where I were arrested, they would kill me. Why does the car say that, the imposter say that? For two reasons. One is that, let's face it, it's flattering for Grandma to get this call and be told by the imposter grandson, in, in essence, I trust you, Grandma, with my deep, dark secret of my arrest more than I trust my own grandparent. It's a flattering thing. Flattery will get you everywhere. And the other reason is that if grandma picks up the phone and calls her adult children or calls her grandson, they're gonna let her know that this call is a scam. So they're trying to isolate the victim. Oftentimes the, call, the grandma would say, you know, Johnny, it doesn't sound like you because of course it wasn't him, it was an imposter. They'd have an answer for that. Either the caller would say, oh grandma, they've had me in jail for 48 hours with nothing to eat or drink, or oh grandma, I've had a cold or something like that. And if grandma remained suspicious, con artist number one 
would hand off the phone to his partner in crime, Con Ernest number two, saying, Grandma, let me put you on the phone with my attorney. Now Grandma's speaking to someone she's never spoken with before. Voice recognition is no longer a factor. The fake attorney will corroborate the whole fake story and then ratchet up the urgency by saying, if you can get me the bail money today, I'll have Johnny back home on a plane tonight. But if I don't get the money today, it'll probably be two or three weeks before we go back in front of a judge and your beloved grandson will remain in jail during all that time. So the, the pressure to act was immediate. Um, I got a call at work a few years ago and believe it or not, it was from Dr. Ruth Westheimer, the famous TV psychotherapist. And she had turned out had come this close to falling for the scam. She was on her way to go buy the gift cards that the fake grandson had called her and told her to buy. When luckily Dr. Ruth's daughter called her. And Dr. Ruth kind of angrily said to her daughter, you know, your stupid son got himself arrested and now I've got to bail him out. And Dr. Ruth saw her said, he's here with me now. He wasn't arrested at all. So Dr. Ruth realized it was a scam and she offered to help us get the word out by creating a public service announcement. So if we could cue that up and play it, let's go with the Dr. Ruth grandparent scam video. Grandma, I love you so much and I never ever want to see you get hurt. Hello? Grandma, I, I need help. There's a very pervasive telephone scam targeting older adults. It's called the grandparent scam. We've had my parents, but we got arrested last night in a rented car. They found drugs and I need bail. When I heard you were in trouble, went to the bank, bought the cards, and sent them out. I thought that I was doing a good thing. This is a preventable scam if people know about it. And in particular, we've tried taking an intergenerational approach by working with students at the high school level to enlist them to be fraud fighters to warn their own parents and grandparents about the scam. Grandma, don't fall for the scam, please. I care about you. I don't want your money getting taken away ever again. Say words to the effect of, Hey, Grandma, if you get a call this summer from someone who says it's me and that I'm in trouble and you need to send money quickly, ask me some questions that only I would know the answer to. Grandma, what was the name of our first dog? If I don't call you Grandma Vita, it's not me. What was my first word I said when I was a baby? If you ask me about my hair and I say that I have it, it's not me. <laughs> don't listen to the caller. They'll try to isolate you. Do everything you can to verify that the problem is legitimate before you send money. The goal is that everybody becomes aware of the scam so it simply won't work anymore. Maybe there's a grandparent who doesn't get out much, but a word from that person's grandchild might make all the difference in saving them from becoming a victim of the scam. Now, during the pandemic, we've begun to see a new twist on the grandparent scam. Instead of the car pretending to be the grandson, he pretends to be a court official or a bail bondsman calling about the grandson who's been arrested. Uh, and also, instead of telling grandma to go out and buy gift cards, they're more often now arranging for a courier to come pick up cash in person. And we think the reason for that, especially during the height of the pandemic, was that a lot of us were reluctant to go to a store. We didn't want to go to a store. We didn't want to have to uh, um, buy gift cards but we probably had some cash in the bank in the house or we'd be willing to go to the bank and make a withdrawal from an ATM machine. So the good news is that some of these guys are now getting caught, uh, that when they're calling from somewhere anywhere in the world, it's very hard to catch them. But when they're coming by to pick up the money in person, it does make them more catchable. If grandma gets suspicious between the time she hangs up the phone and the person arrives to pick up the money, an arrest can be made. But it's also scary to think now that these are targeted. The callers know the name of the grandparent, the name of the grandchild the address of where the grandparent lives and they're coming to pick up the money in person. Now, I mentioned earlier Bernie Madoff and the greed factor. Uh, you may have seen, uh, remember back in the days when you were getting phone calls and letters saying, congratulations, you've won a lottery, you've won the Spanish lottery, the Canadian lottery, the Jamaican lottery, some foreign lottery. And the way the scam works is they tell you, congratulations, you're a millionaire, but before we can send you the money, you've got to pay us some taxes and fees in advance. And if you do that, of course, they're going to keep your money and you're never going to get the winnings. 
And you know, the old saying is you have to be in it to win it when it comes to the lottery. So if you weren't in Spain, you didn't buy a lottery ticket when you were there, you couldn't have won. Uh, so be aware on the lookout for that one. A scam we've seen an uptick during the pandemic is the so-called utility scam, where the caller says he's from your local electric utility. You're behind on your bill and we're gonna cut off your electricity if you don't pay up fast. And the reason this has become a more compelling um, scam during the pandemic is because many people may be behind on their bill or be worried about being behind on their bill. The, the pandemic generally has ratcheted up all kinds of emotions we're feeling, including financial insecurity. And to give you an example of how powerful this call can be, I wanna share a story involving my beloved mother. My mother passed away a couple of years ago just before the pandemic started. But before that, she was living in Manhattan in the apartment I grew up in. And she, my, my son who got a job in Manhattan was living with her. And one day my cell phone rings about four o'clock in the afternoon and it's my mother. And she sounded more hysterical than I've ever heard her sound in my entire life. She was literally screaming into the phone that Con Ed had called, that she owed $800 and they were gonna turn off her electricity. If she didn't go out and buy gift cards and call back with a serial number. It was a very hot day in August. It was during a heat wave. So she was especially panic stricken by that. So I started saying, hey, mom, come on. I'm the statewide elder abuse coordinator. You've heard me talk about these scams. This is a scam, don't fall for it. And she was insistent. She kept screaming at me over the phone. It's not a scam, it's legitimate. They gave me a callback number, she said. I called them back and they confirmed that I owe $800. So I said, well, was the callback number something like 1-800-CONED? I wasn't sure the exact number, but I knew it was something like that. She said, no, it was a 917 number, cell number. So I said, mom, you just called the scammers back and they told you you owe the money. So finally, I talked her off the ledge. She was on her way to the Dwayne Reed around the corner from her apartment when she called me. I talked her off the ledge. She went back to her apartment. And when she got there, I said, by, by the way, mom, you do realize that David, your grandson, my son, now that he's living with you, he pays the Con Ed bill online every month. The account isn't even in your name anymore. And she said, oh, Gary, you're right. I feel so stupid. But I said, mom, it's not about stupidity. It's about emotions. They scared you. It's a hot day in August. You didn't want to lose your electricity. And that's how it worked. But when I heard that sound in my mother's voice that I'd never heard before, it gave me up close and personal experience and just how compelling these calls can be. We're seeing a lot of charity scams during the pandemic. We wanna be generous to those in need during the pandemic, but we also need to be careful. So you wanna make sure you're giving to known charities, charities you've dealt with before, charities you've heard of before. Go online, do some research about the char charity before you give. And be wary if you get a telephone solicitation for a charity. And I say that for two reasons. The first is that the caller could be a scammer who doesn't even work for the chair. But the second reason is that on average, the fundraisers who make those calls for legitimate charities keep about a third of the donation as their fee. So if you make a hundred dollar donation over the phone, on average, the fundraiser, the professional who called you is going to keep $33 and only $67 of your donation of your money will actually be a donation to the charity you want to support. So if you get a call from a charity, you don't have to be uh, compelled to give. Tell them to put you something in writing. If it's a real charity, they will. You can then mail them a check. You can go online and make a direct deposit, a direct contribution that way. But be wary of, 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 of charitable solicitation calls. A very common scam that's gotten more common during the pandemic because so many of us are home so much of the time is the so-called tech support scam. The caller says he's with Amazon or Google or some other tech company that your computer is running slowly or broken and that if you give that person remote access to your computer, he can fix it online. What's amazing about the scam is that it really works. On average, it's estimated, as I mentioned earlier, that these phone scams work about one in 50 calls. The tech support scam is estimated to work about one in six calls. And the emotion that it triggers is a little less clear. IRS scam, it's fear. Grandparent scam, it's love. But what I think it is with the tech support scam is that we're all using computers. We're reliant on computers but we don't really know how they work. And when someone says they can fix it for you and make it work better, it's tempting to go along with it. Now, of course, if you do what the caller says to do and you give him remote access to your computer, and sometimes you'll see this as a pop-up screen on your computer, it's the same scam. What they then do is they put ransomware on your computer and they'll only unlock it, if at all, if you go out and buy uh, gift cards and call back with a serial number. So be on the lookout for the tech support scam. And then there's a scam called the romance scam. And this is a really sad scam. As more and more older adults are feeling socially isolated, lonely, they're going online to try to meet someone. And unfortunately, there are scammers and predators out there lying in wait with fake profiles on these websites. When they see a new older adult, an older adult posts a new profile, they'll reach out to that person. 
They'll engage in all kinds of lovey-dovey messaging. They'll try to take that messaging, by the way, off the website onto private email or texting. They'll always have an excuse why they can't come see you in person. And then inevitably, after a period of a couple of maybe months or so of grooming, comes the ask for money. I broke my leg. I can't pay for the, the doctor bill. My business is failing. I need help. Something of that type. And all too often, the victim will donate the money. And what's kind of scary about the romance scam, well, let me put it to you this way. If someone calls the attorney general's office and says, I got a call from a car who says he's with the IRS and I owe back taxes. And we tell that person it's a scam. Their reaction is relief, joy. They're happy. They don't want to get scammed. They, they're relieved to know that this was a scam. But when you try to convince someone that they're being victimized in a romance scam, in essence, what you're doing is you're breaking their heart. You're telling them that this new source of love in their life this new source of compassion in their life, this person who's helping to ease their sense of loneliness and social isolation is really a scammer. All too often, the victims just refuse to believe it and they'll keep sending the money. And I know families, I just spoke to a, a, someone yesterday that really have to resort to self-help in that situation. Change the older adult's phone number, check the mail going in and out of the apartment, change the password on the computer just to try to literally make it so much harder for the scammer to get in touch with the victim and for the victim to respond. Uh, it's a very sad thing, and we've seen a steep rise in romance scams during the pandemic. Now, you may have heard me mention several times now that the scammers are asking for gift cards. And I mention that because that has become the method of choice that scammers are now using to get money from victims. Up until a couple of years ago, they were more, more often telling you to go to the bank or go to Western Union and wire money. But the banks and Western Unions have now gotten better at training their tellers and cashiers that if the proverbial little old lady walks in and says, my grandson called, he's been arrested, or the IRS called, they're gonna warn that person that this is a scam. But the likelihood that you're gonna, that the cashier at a store, when you go to buy gift cards, is gonna ask you, why are you buying them and engaging in that kind of a conversation is much less. And so that's become the method of choice. So it's a huge red flag. If someone asks you to pay for anything by gift card, it is a scam. Gift cards are to be used to make gifts, not to pay debts. In fact, it's gotten so bad and so widespread the Federal Trade Commission has now imposed a rule that prohibits telemarketers for asking or receiving for payment by wire transfer or gift card transfer. It's a huge red flag, a huge sign of a scam. Now, what can you do to try to stay safe and not get ripped off on the phone? The first thing we suggest is to think of the phone as a one-way street. And by that, we mean only give out personal information over the phone if you made the call to a number that you know to be the real number of your bank, your credit card company, or a government agency. When somebody calls you, you can never really be sure that they are who they say they are. And one of the techniques they use to make these calls seem more believable is called caller ID spoofing. They can spoof caller ID to make your caller ID say whatever they want it to. So if the caller is saying he's an IRS agent, they can make your caller ID say Internal Revenue Service. If the caller is pretending to be your grandson arrested in Montreal, Canada, they can make your caller ID show a Montreal, Canada phone number, even though the caller could really be anywhere in the world. So if you do get a call, and I'll give you an example, you get a call and the caller says it's your bank and it looks like there may be some problem with your account. Don't respond to that call. Get out your bank statement, call, look up the phone number and call the bank back directly. You get a text message that says it's from your credit card company. It looks like there are some unauthorized charges. Don't respond to the link in that text message. Get out your credit card, look up the toll free number and call them back so you can be sure that that's who you're really talking to. We also suggest that you use caller ID as a screening tool and simply don't answer the phone if you don't recognize the number. It's not a perfect tool. Sometimes you may miss a call you wish you had picked up on, but if it's a real legitimate caller, they'll leave a message and you can call back. If it's a scammer, they probably won't leave a message and even if they do, you can easily delete it. When I give this comment in front of a live audience, someone will almost inevitably raise their hand and say, Mr. Brown, Here's what I do when I see a caller ID number uh, that I don't recognize. I answer the phone, I get on the phone with them and I waste five or 10 minutes of their time talking all kinds of gibberish and nonsense. And then I go, ha ha, and I hang up the phone and it makes me feel good. Well, it may make you feel good, but we discourage you for doing, from doing it for two reasons. Number one is you just wasted five or 10 minutes of your own time. But more importantly, these calls are generated by a computer program that can tell if a live voice answers the phone. And if you do answer the phone, no matter what you say, the program is designed to keep calling your number and your, that spammer will probably sell your number to another who will call you as well. The point being that the more of these calls you get answer, the more you're going to get, and the fewer you answer, the fewer you're going to get. So try not to answer the phone unless you can recognize the number. 
phone providers, many of them now are providing spam warnings. You'll see something that says potential spam. What they're doing is they're warning you in essence that the caller that made that call was using caller ID spoofing, that the number that originated the call was not the same number that you would have seen on your caller ID. And if you see that warning, don't answer the phone. Why would you wanna answer a call when the caller is using caller ID spoofing like that? There's a rule that is gonna go into, fully go into effect in 2023 that's gonna require all phone carriers in the United States to have this technology so they can warn you if caller ID is being used. But some of the smaller phone carriers have not yet implemented this new technology. And the scammers, of course, are now routing their calls uh, through those smaller carriers. So uh, it doesn't, it's not a foolproof system, but it will hopefully get better. As more and more of us are not answering the phone unless we recognize the number, the scammers are trying to trick us by using a technique called neighbor spoofing. They spoof a number that's in your same area code, maybe even in your same exchange, hoping you'll think it's a local business or a neighbor and that you'll answer the phone on that basis. Don't fall for it. Don't answer the phone unless you recognize the entire number. They're also trying to trick us by doing something called same number spoofing. And I have to admit, I fell for this one. A couple of years ago, my cell phone rang and it showed my number as the number on caller ID. So I answered the phone and it was that extended car warranty call uh, that you may have heard about. But uh, I answered the number out of curiosity. I thought, did I butt dial myself? How can you dial your own number? The answer is you can't butt dial yourself. And if you see your own number appear, don't answer it. There are also services that you can subscribe to that will essentially screen your calls on the way in. And if they, they can see that it's a scam or a robo call, you'll hear one ring and then the call goes dead. I don't choose to use one of those services. I simply try not to answer the phone if I don't recognize the number, but that's another option. A frequent question that I'm asked is, what about the do not call registry? I'm signed up for the do not call registry, but I'm still getting all these robocalls and scam calls. Does the thing even work anymore? And the answer is yes and no. Yes, the do not call registry works very effectively at stopping American-based companies, law compliant companies from calling you once you've signed up. However, it has very little deterrent effect on scammers calling from anywhere in the world using caller ID spoofing. Because even if you report to the Federal Trade Commission the number that called you, it wasn't really the number you saw in your caller ID, it wasn't really the number that called you. So it doesn't work very well right now to deter scam calls, but it does work very effectively at least reducing those business calls. You won't get calls from newspapers trying to sell you a subscription, things like that. As we get older and we're online and we're using all these websites, we have to create all these passwords, right? And if there's a weakness that we may have as we get older, we're, we're worried about forgetting our passwords. And so the mistake some people make is they choose a password that they know they won't forget, like a grandchild's name, their street address, their date of birth, something like that. That's a real mistake because the scammers will go online and try to research some stuff about you. They'll go on social media and then they'll try to guess, if they have your username, They'll try to guess your passwords. So you want to come up with a password that you can remember, but that no one else can figure out. And one of the ways we suggest you think about doing that is to think of a song, a poem, a figure of speech that you'll never forget and make an acronym out of the first letter of each word. So for example, we all learned in high school that President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address began four score and seven years ago. Well, if you made an acronym out of that, F-S-A-S-Y-A, you capitalize one of the letters and maybe added a number and exclamation point at the end. Even if you can't remember FSASYA, as long as you can remember four score and seven years ago, you should be able to recreate your password. My mother's Gmail password for many years was the first letter of the Shakespearean line, to be or not to be, that is the question. And then she had a number after that. Now, if I asked her mom, what's your password? She couldn't spit it out. When she sat down at her iPad, she could easily type it out because it was easy to type out the first letter of each of those words. Another vulnerability is the security question that we have to answer when we open accounts. What scammers will now sometimes do if they get your username is they'll purposely enter gibberish passwords to prompt the security question to get posted. And then they'll hope it's a question that they can go online and research and Google you about. So for example, if your security question is mother's maiden name or city of birth, those are very weak security questions to use. It's too easy for someone to Google that. Come up with a question that you'll know the answer to, but isn't searchable. So for example, when I was a kid, my favorite athlete growing up was Bill Bradley, the basketball player for the Knicks, later the US Senator. If I chose the question favorite childhood hero or favorite childhood athlete and put in the answer as Bill Bradley, you can't go online and Google me and find that out. So that would be a safer a question to use. 
when you get emails and they're unsolicited emails, in other words, it's not an email in response to something you sent, it's just coming out of the blue, be wary because they can be what's called phishing emails. They're lookalike emails trying to prompt you to hit the link and reply and start providing personal identifying information. So if you get an email from, and it's not in reply to an email you sent, the safer approach would be to go directly to the company's website and log on and communicate with them that way, call them on the phone, communicate with them that way, beware of phishing emails because they can look astonishingly like uh, the real thing. Um, Senator Kruger, I think that I'm gonna call it uh, quits at that point and be glad to take any questions people may have. By the way, if, right. you're, if, if you have a complaint, please feel free to reach out to the AG's office. I think the toll-free number has been posted 1-800-771-7755 or go online. You can file a complaint with us online and also get a lot of the information I've talked about directly from our website. That's great, Gary. Thank you. We've been um, posting quite a number of um, different resources for people as you were speaking and giving examples and <clears throat> really appreciate your sharing your own stories from your family because I do yeah. think, you know, I, I know with both of my parents towards the end of their life, they each you know, got caught up in these <clears throat> at some level. And I remember my mother saying, I was so embarrassed. I didn't want to tell you. Yeah. It's like, no, but if you tell me, we can just cancel your credit card. They're not going to charge you anything for it. And you're going to get a new credit card and it's going to be okay. But if you, cause she'd given it to someone over the phone and then realized she got scammed. And so it's really <laughs> important that we assure people if you think you got caught up in something, you need to reach out because there's probably a way to help resolve whatever the incident is for you. Um, and again, I just to remind everyone, if you give away your credit card number and then you realize this was not what you intended to do, that will pretty much be treated in most cases by your credit card company as like if somebody stole your number and under federal law, the maximum they can charge you is $50. And most of them don't even do that. And that's what I was gonna say, it's my experience. Yeah. Most of them don't, they start a report and they send you out a new credit card right away because they don't wanna lose you as a customer. So I really do appreciate Dr. Ruth speaking out, you're speaking with your, about your own parents, <clears throat> my speaking with my, about my own parents because there's nobody who isn't going to get hit with these. And the, just the question is to think clearly about why maybe you shouldn't believe it. Um, and particularly, as you pointed out, if it looks good, too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. Yeah. And, you know, be really careful. So we have many questions and we'll see how many we can get through here this evening. So what efforts are law enforcement in this country making to stop and arrest the actual scammers? You know, it's a good question. And I wish I had a better or more positive answer because the, the truthful answer is that for the most part, we can't stop them. They can be anywhere in the world. They use sophisticated technology and they're very hard to catch. And even in the rare instance when they do get caught, they just pop up in another site and move elsewhere. So for example, there was a, a ring in Mumbai, India that was busted for the IRS scam about three years ago. Hundreds of people were reporting to work every day in an office building and their job was to call Americans, pretend to be an IRS agent and try to rip them off. The ring gets busted, the building is closed down. For about three months, we get many fewer complaints about the IRS call and then about three months later, it starts all over again. So that's why we're emphasizing prevention and, 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 and outreach so much because realistically, for the most part, until we make some technological advances, we're never gonna be able to stop and arrest all these guys. Unfortunately. Um, how do you block and eliminate certain kinds of calls and texts? So for example, I keep getting unwanted text messages, some of them asking me for money. Yeah. Um, I get these robo calls that go on forever. Um, is there a way to block them calling my phone or coming onto my computer and my when text? It comes to yeah, when it comes to the phone calls, there are some services you can subscribe to that will attempt to block as many of them as, the, as they can. I'm not obviously in a position to endorse any, but I'll just mention two of the more well-known companies. One is called Nomo Robo, N-O-M-O-R-O-B-O, -O -O, and the other is called Robo Killer. And for a small monthly fee, they will screen your calls and they'll try to block as many of them as you can. 
Uh, you can also, if you're getting a call, you can try blocking the number on your cell phone. The problem with doing that though, is if the call used caller ID spoofing, you're not really blocking the number that called you in the first place, so that can be of limited effectiveness. You can try to do the same thing when it comes to unwanted texts. Gosh. And this one is about trolling scammers, particularly those trying to bilk Medicare. Do you, are you aware of some specific Medicare bilking scam? Yeah, I mentioned earlier that Becky from Medicare call where the caller pretends to be Becky from Medicare. She says you qualify for free genetic cancer screening and wants you to give your Medicare number over the phone. That's become the most common of those scams now. And Medicare doesn't call you on the phone. So as soon as someone calls you and says it's Medicare, hang up. And even better, don't have answered the phone in the first place. Got it. Um, all right, how do you ID a scam? How do you tell the difference between a real and a fake email or text that says there's possible fraud on your bank or credit card account? Is this a kind of information that never gets sent via email or text, question mark? It's a great question. Sometimes your bank or your credit card company may actually try communicating with you by email, but don't respond to that email. Use that as a prompt to get on their website and contact them back directly or call them at the number you know to be the real number. Because the fact is, it's very hard to tell if these texts or emails are real, so assume that they're not and act accordingly. That's really, that's happened to me. And it's really important to remember just if it's your, if it's your bank card or your credit card, it has a phone number on the back of it. And yeah. call them and say, did you text me? Did you email me? Can I talk to someone about this? And they all have fraud divisions and they're happy to, you know, move you into their fraud division to review things. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, in fact, I got a letter in the mail the other day telling me that I owed back, I owed money on credit card, and they were going to hit me with some enormous amount of penalty and take me to court unless I immediately called them and agreed mm -hmm. to sign up for their service where they would put me on a per month have to pay it back. And there was a phone number, but instead of calling the phone number, I Googled the phone number on my computer. And when I Googled the phone number, I came across like endless, this is a scam. Yeah. This phone number is associated with this letter. If you call them, they won't tell you what credit card you owe money on, but they'll assure you that they're legitimate and you owe this money. And I was like, I don't actually owe money on my credit card right. at all. Um, and so I was really glad that I didn't even call the number because again, yeah. as you were presenting, they want you to call them. They know then your phone number and they have access to you. So yeah. you really even want to avoid that, right? Absolutely. You don't want to return those calls. <clears throat> and it's a great thing that you did send our crew, which is you can go on Google or any of the search engines, type in the phone number and do a reverse search. And oftentimes you'll see that it's a fake number or it's associated with scam. Right. Now, this one was pretty amazing because it was like pages and pages of like scam stories off of this phone number with pictures of the exact same letter I got. So apparently that's a big one out there. And when we get complaints of that type, we forward them to the U.S. Postal Inspector because when they're using the U.S. mail system, it makes it more trackable than when they're using the Internet. And sometimes these guys do get caught. Good. All right, let's see. In order to get a credit report, the three companies require social security numbers, which I'm hesitant to provide online. They make it impossible to make requests by phone unless one wants to be paying to subscribe. Does the speaker know anything about the US government? I don't know if these are two questions separately, so let me just stop there. So. Yeah. What do you do when you don't want to put your social security number on a computer? You, you cannot get your credit report unless you provide your social security number because that's the means by which they identify you. But the place you should be getting your credit report is at a website called annualcreditreport.com, which the government required the three major credit reporting agencies to set up. You can order your credit, free credit reports. They're giving them out much more frequently than they were required to previously due to COVID. I think you can get one a week if you really, even really want one go to annualcreditreport.com, but you will have to enter your social security number. Thank you. And are you familiar with a website that's just us.gov with the phone number 
877-322-8228. I believe that telephone number appears on annual credit report, the annual credit report.com website. Okay. And that's the okay one to work with. Yes. Annual credit report.com. And then sometimes when somebody has stolen your information in some way, perhaps they, you know, they steal some company's entire email system or list, you'll get a notice that you're going to get free credit reporting service for a year. Yeah. Is that scam in its own way or is that real? It's not a scam, but if you don't cancel after a year, they're going to start to bill you. So you need to be mindful of that. I've spoken to so many people who said, you know, I took advantage of the free year and that was four years ago. And I didn't realize until I checked my credit card bill, I've been paying ever since. Oh, okay. That's important. To so know. if you take advantage of the free year, you may want to cancel at the end of the free year, unless you're still having uh, credit reporting issues. Got it. Okay. My spam folder is now about 300 items a day. Oh, this is me. Yikes, I am finding that supposedly reputable internet security organizations like McCaffrey, LifeLock, and even Norton are harassing me with 10 spam mails per day. They either want me to renew or treat me as if I've already subscribed. I just cannot get rid of them. Is this a technique they are using to scare me into subscribing? Who do I complain to? How do I get them to stop? I feel like I wrote this question to you. This is me. <laughs> well, for starters, what you want to do, to, if you want to see if the email is, is real, is le legitimately coming from the company that claims to be the sender, is put your cursor, your mouse cursor, over the email address as it appears in email. So you'll see the actual web address of it. So if it claims to be from McAfee, and then you put your cursor over there, and it says johndoe.com, you know it's a spam email. But even if it is really from McAfee or one of these companies, you can still easily block emails. Any of the major Gmail or other uh, email services allow you to block an email. And I've been blocking more and more of them, Senator Kruger, because I'm sick of getting the same emails every day. And it's interesting that they mentioned Norton and McCaffrey because I'm getting them from somebody who says I subscribe to Norton and I need I pay I have to pay them two hundred and seventy dollars and twenty two cents or something. And I'm like, oh, I would never pay one of these companies that much. I didn't subscribe to that. And you're right. Yeah. And then I looked at the email and it's not from Norton. It's right. not coming from them at all. I, I also got that email supposedly from Norton about the fee that I owed. And they, they also had a phone number in there that if I called back the number, they would have started telling me, you know, give me your credit card number over the phone and like. So that's an example of a scam email. You did the right thing by pointing your cursor over the address to see it really wasn't from Norton. Right. Okay internet safety what does a vpn program on your computer protect you from a vpn program is really good so i'm on, i'm using my work computer right now and i'm on a vpn network what it means is that your internet address your ip address is not let it's not visible to either your internet service provider or to websites you log on to so it allows you to really surf the internet much more anonymously than you can without a VPN network where every time you log on to anything, they can see who you are and where you're logging on from. Hmm. There are some free VPN services out there and there are some paid services. Uh, anecdotally, I've heard that the free ones don't work nearly as well as the paid ones, which probably makes sense, but you, the, the listeners and the watchers and I can go online and, and just Google VPN and see what their options are. So huh, if you press decline on your cell phone, does the spammer now know that this is a real phone number? I wouldn't even know where a decline op button is on my cell phone. Yeah, never hit any button. A decline button, or if they tell you to hit one to get off the list or two to get off, never hit a button, just hang up. And again, preferably okay. don't have answered the call in the first place. Got it. Um, some legitimate question, companies I use ask for my social security number after I call to ask for something. The social security is my ID number required by the company. That's what they say. So for example, dent dental insurance company uses social security number as the ID number. Am I at risk um, if I give them that number and why aren't companies forbidden to use social security numbers as ID numbers? they really should not be using social security numbers as ID numbers and the health insurers have stopped doing it for the most part. 
you go to your doctor's office or you go to a health insurance file health insurance claim they do not need to know your social security number don't provide it that's what i thought thank you um so you described before the risks of overly simple um, security questions so what if your bank does use a really simple one like they say give me your mother's maiden name um can you tell the bank no you have to come up with better questions yeah they do have better questions when you when you go to that line on the website if you click the drop down button you'll see there's all these different questions that you can answer not just the ones that display at the top at the beginning okay. and are you concerned at all about the options with a lot of cell phones now where it looks at your face and it lets you in rather than use passwords are there any particular concerns or advantages to using that system? I mean, I think the privacy concern is that if, if I got mugged on the street, all the mugger would have to do is hold the face up to my face, the phone up to my face and be able to unlock it that way. So I'm not so sure that I would be so quick to want to utilize that feature. Got it. Now it's true, they could also make me stick my thumb on the thing if I have a thumbprint uh, opening. But if all you have is a path, is, you know, is a four digit number, it makes it, that's the most secure way to keep your phone secure. You have to hit the number every time you, you turn the phone back on, but it's the most secure way. Right, so I've noticed a lot of the younger people are somehow like putting their credit card on their phone so they can just pay for things by waving their phone instead yeah. of even pulling out their credit card and waving their credit card. And somebody told me that there are ways for people to steal that information if they're just standing close to you when you wave your phone at certain systems? Have you heard that at all? You know, I haven't heard of it, but I could imagine that they have the same reader device standing nearby where you're really waving your, your, you know, you're waving your credit card under their machine and they've got another one nearby that's getting the same data. So I'm not a big fan of that. Okay, so you don't really recommend that, that people put their credit cards on the phone and use them for all these, you know, everything purposes. My son is 25. They, I'm sure my 25-year-old yeah. son is doing that, but I'm not. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Right, because also then if they steal your phone and they've held it up to your face, so they have access, then they also have your credit card, right? I mean, they can waive their credit, your credit card and things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, actually, we just have one last question, and it's not exactly on point, but you're a good person to ask. Do you have jurisdiction in your office or to somebody else over um, abuse of elderly people by family members? Generally speaking, cases like that are prosecuted by district attorneys who have direct criminal jurisdiction, uh, not by the attorney general. However, we do have a Medicaid fraud control unit. If the abuse takes place in an institutional setting, in a nursing home, for example, then the AG has jurisdiction. But otherwise, you should be reaching out to your local police and your local district attorney. So yes, I do know that the Manhattan DA's office has an elder abuse line. Um, obviously our DA is changing in January, but I'm assuming our new DA will continue that service. Um, but for whoever, whoever who type, whoever wrote that question in, I would also recommend try the Manhattan DA elder abuse line, unless you are living in a different borough or the person you're concerned about is living in a different borough. Yeah. Right. Oh, one more question. How do, you how do you disable facial recognition on Apple cell phones? I don't know the answer to that because I have an older phone that doesn't even have facial recognition, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but okay. you may want to go on the Apple website to figure out how to do that. Got it. Yeah, and that's again, for me, I just like type into Google, how do you? Yeah. And it's, it's amazing how often the answers pop up. Right. Um, and then if you, you just Google through. how disable facial recognition iPhone, you're going to get the answer right there. Yeah, I think so too. Well, with that, this is like the lightning round um, and you did fabulously. So okay. thank you so much for your presentation, for your being here with us tonight, um, for your willingness to spend, you know, your evening with us presenting this information. And I really appreciate, and I know that our listeners and watchers also appreciated this. And so I want to remind everybody that we've got our next virtual town hall meeting. We're giving you a break. It's like school. 
you know, mm-hmm. take off for the holidays. We'll be back January 6th at 7 p.m. And we're going to be providing information about how to apply for the Federal Emergency Housing Grant Program, which assists qualified property owners who are behind on their maintenance, mortgage payments, or property taxes. We have talked about in the past the emergency rent money that was made available, and we helped people walk through those applications. Um, But there's also federal funding for homeowners, which includes for co-ops and condos, and it can be up to $50,000. And the application process starts in early January, so we wanted to jump right on it and make sure that we got you all presentations. So if you think you might be eligible or you have friends or family who own their own home or apartment are behind because COVID has driven everybody to be behind on maintenance, mortgage payments, property taxes. Um, Please know that they might want to tune in January 6th from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. I want to thank, of course, our guests, and I want to thank all of you for participating tonight. As always, I want to thank my amazing staff, who I could not do any of this without. I want to wish everybody happy holidays, whatever holidays you may be celebrating. But remember, as you're celebrating, we have to be really, really conscientious about washing our hands, wearing masks, indoor settings, getting vaccinated, getting boosted, testing if you think that you're at all sick so that the city can continue to track and help people as quickly as possible and get those tests if you're not feeling right, whether or not you've been vaccinated, whether or not you feel okay, but you've learned that you were exposed to someone who had COVID. Um, You can get the COVID test information and most of the other information about how to get vaccinated through a number of excellent websites that we provide also information on on our website. And so again, everybody have a safe, and healthy end of the year. And let's all count on a safer, healthier 2022. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Good night. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.